We'll be thinking a lot about the journey of forgiveness as more than a one-time event, but an ongoing unfolding. The class I'm doing, in addition to just talking about forgiveness in general, specifically is a theater class sitting on this play yes. called The Amish Project, right. which talks about this shooting yes. from 2006 in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. And most of us in this class were not really aware right. of what was going on. I mean, you were little. Around, we were little. Some of us were maybe kind of old enough, like I kind of remember my parents right. talking about it, but that's because of like how close I was. Right. To it. So I was like really. Geographically, you were very close. Yep. Yeah. But you were an adult. So can you talk about that? Yeah. What you remember things yeah. like that? Yeah. Every mass shooting is traumatic for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one was particularly so in that the innocence of the, the victims, I'm not unlike Sandy Hook, mm -hmm. and the way in which he approached them, separated them out. And I think we've got accounts of. Uh, the older girls trying to protect younger girls. So the act in and of itself was mm -hmm. horrific. Yeah. And then what was so fascinating to watch was the community's response to it. The mm -hmm. Amish community's response and then kind of the nation's response to the Amish community's response. Mm -hmm. So the Amish are very quick. They reach out to his wife mm -hmm. and his kids. Um, they rally around each other. Um, there's very much immediately this talk of this is horrible, but we will we will get through this as a community, and we can move into forgiveness, and we're going to do that together. No family has to figure that out on their own. We're going to do that together as a community because this affected all of us. And so there were folks in national news media kind of things who I think looked at the Amish as kind of this quirky little group that does their funny little things out of some sort of religious foundation but until they actually acted like jesus followers and we're like no this is who we are this is why we do the quirky things like drive horse and buggy because we're followers of jesus that's the core and so their acts of forgiveness and grace toward this person's family toward each other toward outsiders who came into their community to even film and talk to them and those kinds of moves were made everybody who wasn't a Jesus follower kind of stop and go, wait, what? What? Th mm -hmm. These people are real. They're legitimate. Like, we hear people talk about what it means to follow Jesus, but these people are actually doing it. And yeah, they have some quirky ways on the side, but this whole forgiveness thing seems pretty central to who they are. And it wasn't like they had to drum up the resources. That's the other thing. It was obvious this is a community that's been doing this for a while. This was not new to them. This was a muscle they had already developed and they just applied it in this particular way. Forgiveness turns on empathy. And by empathy, I'm talking about empathic regard and concern for others, but also perspective taking, because pain shuts us down and constrains us. But perspective taking allows us to see other possibilities. One of the things that it sounds like really impressed you, in addition to impressing the nation at large, was how radical almost the Amish forgiveness was. Mm -hmm. And that just makes me curious. How do you define forgiveness? Mm. I actually talk about forgiveness a lot with students mm -hmm. and staff and faculty. Sure. Because the longer you live in life, the more you have to forgive. Mm -hmm. Just the way it is. And forgiveness to me is being able to say, I no longer hold this against this person and I wish them well. And now wishing well in the Christian mm -hmm. context means I pray that this person is restored in the relationship to God, that they're able to see what they did wrong, confess to him, and maybe someday the two of us can be reconciled, which is different from forgiveness, mm -hmm. but I release this person and I am no longer bound to my anger and woundedness. Forgiveness is like, I let you go 
I no longer hold you accountable that you owe me something. And that's a hard move because the world says we're owed. Somebody's wounded us, we're owed. And to be able to forgive is like, I, I'm letting that go. So this Amish community could have sued this woman and her kids, right? Could have said, you owe us for the lives of our children. And they didn't. Instead, they said, we're going to take care of you because you too have been wounded in this. And that was, that continues to be remarkable. And at the time, I felt so proud of them in a way, like so proud to be a Jesus person. It was like, yeah, this is, these are our people. This is what we're trying to do. And our reputation in the world isn't so, we so great. Um, and that was 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not so great now. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, this is, this is the kind of thing I want people to know about Jesus people, is that when we practice these muscles, we're strong in places that other people aren't strong. And so the call and the invitation to forgiveness is this call to be able to say, I lay down what you owe me. As a class, we watched The Amish, American Experience a documentary that talks about both the real-life events of the shooting and the Amish community's response to it. In the documentary, a professor of anthropology talked about why the Amish, both in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, and across the U.S. and Canada as a whole, have lived in such isolation. One of these reasons is the concept of collective trauma. I know oh, if thou that justice is served while also great follow-up question practicing forgiveness yeah so as a follower of jesus you say i think god's going to take care of the justice question right mm -hmm. not always yeah. but in the big scheme of things yeah. this doesn't mean that as christians we don't say uh this person wronged me i think they should go to jail right mm -hmm. so if this person had survived i don't think the amish would have said he doesn't have to go to jail but that's also a systematic thing of saying the system mm -hmm. needs to step in and say justice needs to be served. As far as my thing, if I continually am obsessed with making things right, obsessed with you owe me, particularly for the smaller things of life, that only kills me. Justice says there's this sense of you do owe me and society will hold you accountable, right? And so there's this interplay with you know, I may need to forgive and yet justice. So there's a both and where you can ask for justice in the societal systemic place and desire forgiveness. My experiences with collective trauma are multifaceted. The first way is through the trauma of disabled people. I am physically disabled. I have a chronic illness. I'm what people call invisibly disabled, which means you can't tell I have a disability by looking at me. But I still have a lot of struggles that disabled people share, and I have all of the baggage from history of the abuse that disabled people went through, the fight for disabled rights, and the institutionalization that we collectively have suffered. 
What's different about collective trauma for disabled people is disability more often than not is not passed down through generations. Most commonly disability is acquired. Most disabilities are not genetic. So the collective trauma is less familial and more communal through networking and sharing those stories in other ways. And the trauma becomes more isolating because you still experience the weight of the community but you can't share your experiences with the people around you. I do have a genetic disability. I miss that particular experience of how disability trauma manifests and I'm grateful for not experiencing that particular hardship. The second way I experience collective trauma is through the shared collective trauma of the LGBT community. In case you don't know, I'm queer, both in my gender and sexuality. This is not really the place to talk about that explicitly, but you know, as a community, we went through a lot of horrific stuff, specifically the AIDS crisis and sterilization a lot of times and being killed and imprisoned and a whole bunch of stuff. And we have to educate each other on our history because if we don't, who will? Nowadays, you can take an LGBT history course at some colleges or things like that. But really, it's up to the community to reckon with this trauma head on because otherwise nobody is going to remember. And if there's one thing worse than having to remind yourself constantly of your trauma, it's letting your trauma be forgotten to everybody. The final way I experience collective trauma is through my exposure to the Holocaust because I lost a significant number of family members on my mom's side. And for a long, long time, we were really confused as to why. So there was not only this grief that impacted my family, but a lot of confusion. And it was this unrest because some people had been involved in the Dutch resistance. And so there was some certainty there and that wasn't really collective trauma. That was just like, oh, you know, your family kind of did a brave thing and then suffered for it. So collective to our family, not like collective to a larger community, but the others, we didn't have answers for and like maybe they were just associated with the resistance workers but that didn't feel right and then when I went home for break after I wrote the play I wrote for 24-hour theater which was about Hanukkah and I told everyone no I was not Jewish I went home and my mom had found some paperwork indicating that her mom had been lying her whole life about her Jewish status a tactic she had learned in World War II so it turns out that my grandma was Jewish and the way that the matrilinear society works. If my grandma is Jewish, then my mom is like ethnically Jewish in addition to whatever else she is. Uh, and if my mom is ethnically Jewish, then I also am Jewish, which explains why those family members were kept in the Holocaust. So I'm still wrestling with exactly like how Jewish do I want to be? And also, how much do I get to tap into this collective trauma that explains a lot more of why I felt so strongly about this event. It's there, whether I choose to acknowledge it or not, is up to me. I think it's easy to dismiss collective trauma as almost paranoia, but it's people reminding their communities of what happened because people who had power, abused it, and specifically came for them, and why they need to be cautious and the warning signs so that they can avoid it in the future. Decisional forgiveness is very commitment focused. It is a laying down of grudges and revenge. And it is genuine. And Everett Worthington reflects on decisional forgiveness as one way of living out the Amish vision of forgiveness. They honestly embody a commitment to set down grudges, to set down revenge, to respond with compassion, <coughs> respond with love. And they will attest that over time, processing the trauma and the grief and the emotions of forgiveness is a journey that unfolds.
myself in putting on this show, both in general and like at this specific time. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm eager to see it. What's important is not only to have the conversation as a whole community, but the work that you guys are doing in the class will have ripple effects, right? So for two and a half weeks longer, you'll be immersed in thinking about this. This is a really interesting thing. You can't think about forgiveness in the purely hypothetical sense because every one of us has an opportunity where we're like, well, I, that means I'd have to forgive that person. Well, crap, this is personal now. I got business to do. God's got business to do with me. Crap's sake, I don't wanna do it, right? So forgiveness is not hypothetical. Other things we can, like even justice in a certain sense, we can be like, well, let's talk about justice in the hypothetical sense, in the what if sense. Forgiveness is like, you got stuff that was done to you that you need to forgive. Dang it, you know? So the work that you guys are doing together with Dr. Freeberg is important work for you. And how that will ripple out to the community through the course of your lives and your time at Calvin will be really interesting to watch because you are gonna be able to train up your peers in conversations about forgiveness. And you're gonna be able to use language when someone hurts you and actually say, I forgive you. And you're gonna be able to use language like, will you forgive me? And that's radical language in our culture of whatever and you do you and ghosting people rather than actually moving toward intimate relationship. My deep hope is not only for the performance and the conversations that will create in the community, but it's for those of you who've been in this class, how will you carry this into our community in day-to-day -day life? That's, that's what really matters, right? But I'm eager to, to see it, to be reminded also of that time and what happened. I would really love it for forgiveness to be less fascinating. In addition to collective trauma being a reason why the Amish were so isolated for so long and continue to be isolated. It also allowed them to practice collective forgiveness, wherein all the members of the community participated in forgiving. And they not because only they believed that it was an act that impacted but they forgave not only family. as well. The children and their families, but the whole community. And that the forgiveness should as well. So as I guess the culmination of this exploration of forgiveness and my experience with forgiveness, I decided to go on a forgiveness walk. I didn't realize how icy the ecosystem preserve would be, so I'm not going to be super focused on this. But here we are, the crux of this journey. I cannot, on my own, forgive my collective trauma. But I can choose how much I want to let it impact me. And I can choose to work on forgiving those who hurt me in my community for what they did to me and releasing them from the hurt that knowing what they did to my community causes me. And while that doesn't absolve them of the guilt of everything they caused, it's as much as I can do. And frankly, that's as much as I'm willing to do. I would feel guilty for forgiving them for everything. So that's, I think, the easiest part of my forgiveness journey. It feels appropriate that we've come to a uh, standstill at the leaky part of the ecosystem preserve. But when I talk about something that's more of a standstill forgiveness thing, I'm not going to go into detail about this here. You can ask me about this if you know me in person. Appreciate the forgiveness workshop we did in class as an attempt to get us thinking about decisional forgiveness. But the trauma I chose was definitely a trauma larger than two days and a trauma that I probably should not have chosen for that incident. A trauma I was not ready to address with such speed, I guess, but at my own pace and with the hope of people 
who know more than I do, I can choose to, with their help, work on forgiving the people who caused that trauma. The final thing I'm going to talk about on this forgiveness walk is something we didn't really talk about in class, but I still think it's important to the concept of forgiveness. And that's the idea of forgiving ourselves. Because just like other people don't get it right in life and hurt us, the same is true of us. We have to understand that it's okay. And like we, just as others, are only human. And I know we talked about like understanding that others are human just like we are. Because most of the time it's easier to forgive ourselves than other people. But I don't think that's true for everybody. So I don't know if this is for me or for you or for all of us. But just be kind to yourselves. One day after class I was feeling kind of disillusioned with the whole thing and I came up with this idea of dab on forgiveness. As in like, you know, dab. Where D stands for decisional forgiveness. A stands for allow grace to flow in your lives. The your being the perpetrator and the victim. Because I'm assuming you're one of those and be being be kind to yourself and others and came up with that in a facetious moment but the more i think about it the more i think it's actually a fairly decent summary of what we learned in class so make of that what you will we live in a broken world and it's easy to forget that either you or other people deserve forgiveness and I think that comes from the fact that, like, none of us deserve grace. And on some level, we all know that. But, like, we've gotten that grace anyway. I've got a lot of work to do on forgiving. And I've got a lot of feelings about it. Mostly of the I don't want to do it kind. But it's good work. And... It's going to make me a better person. Hello, everyone who's coming to see the show. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it makes you think about your forgiveness. I hope it reminds you that the shooter, Charlie or Eddie or whoever he is to you, is a human just like you are. I hope it reminds you that we shouldn't be defined by our mistakes, even when our mistakes are enormous. But also, sometimes that's the way it goes. And it should be. And uh, to everyone in the class, it has been kind of really weird. Good, wonderful, but kind of really weird too. I appreciate the vulnerability we've crafted, and I'll see you around.